Like in, in the amateur level, in the amateur side of the game, not at all. Like if you're not right, you don't play. Um, and it's, there's no one's really losing out from that. If you don't want to play and they don't want you to play, so you're fit. And then I think kind of like at a mid-level, so I was playing at National 2 and like some National 1 clubs, um, they'll kind of be like, it's not, it's not really said. And then as you go up again at the other level, so a level above like the professional teams and like the Super 6 team that I'm at now, um, they're very hot on it. So if you are not fit to play, you won't play because... You know, they don't want to injure you for any longer than you're already injured because at the end of the day, you are an asset. Um, the clubs, they obviously care for you. Um, and also, you've got more boys of a similar standard of you. Say if you're starting, there'll be lads that can slot in straight away. You're not going to be a massive loss to the team. Whereas at that mid-level, I think National 2, semi-pro level, you, you're kind of pressured a bit to play on. I think we're at a good level at the minute in terms of HIA protocol and like return to play um, and all your baselines and that and whatever. A lot, I know um, all professional clubs do that and most semi-pro clubs do that. A governing body-wise, I think we may have gone a bit too far um, the wrong way in terms of like head contact and red cards and all that. Because that's, that's just a, a knee-jerk reaction to you know, a supposed increase in concussions over the last few years. And that's, I feel like that's kind of having an impact on the game. It's a bit detrimental. I think the orange card is a really good idea. Um, just because it, it, in the modern day game, at the highest level, if you're down to 14 men in the first five, 10 minutes of the game, what's the point in playing the rest of the game? Because modern day attack and modern day Ds, uh, they're so good that if you've got that disadvantage for 70 minutes or, or even less, you basically lost the game. So I think the orange card is really good. I know they're trialling that in... Super rugby, I think, mm. or where you go off for 20 minutes and then another player comes on in your stead. Um, and I think the actual rules themselves on in terms of head on head or shoulder on head, head contact is just too far. Because at the end of the day, like it is, an, it is a contact sport and everyone knows like, what a tackle is, what a collision is in rugby. And like, even something as small as like, kind of like a, a hand grazing the, 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 someone's temple or a shoulder kind of touching someone's jaw in a say if the ball carries going in low the tackle is also going in low this it's always going to happen there's always going to be a degree of head contact that's something we have to accept but if it's like blatantly obvious you know absolutely no mitigation whatsoever I believe a red card should stand but you know it's, it's ruining a lot of games I feel there's a lot more. There's a lot more factors there. Yeah. Considering if, like, it's a lot more collision based now. Defenses are trained to blitz. Players are, you know, two stone heavier than they were before, if not more. Um, I don't think it is poor tackle technique. I think it's just how the game's progressed and the nature of the beast is. It's more collision based now. Tackle technique now is better than it was. You know, previously, 20 years ago, people are getting lower, chop tackles are more prevalent. Um, you get told to attack the ball, yes, but, you know, that's how you play the game. That's good tackle technique, if anything. I think uh, there can be more done in terms of like, communication from governing bodies as to what the risks are, because they don't really say what the risks are, do they, the governing bodies? They just say you might get concussion, this is this, this is that. There should really be some kind of information power there. This is what can happen if you get multiple concussions. Mm. Um, so younger players can make their own decisions. Um, but I think in the rugby community and like the, you know, the young lads coming through, everyone knows kind of what, what they're signing up for. Um, and in terms of like, you know, we've got two, two high profile cases of early onset dementia in rugby players, but, you know, you, out of how many rugby players and a lot of people are predisposed to that anyway. So I think, you know, two high profile cases isn't enough to completely change uh, perspective on the game, if you know what I mean. Mm. Um, 
but yes, I think I think they could be saying more in terms of what the impacts of head injuries are, rather than this is how to avoid getting a head injury. This yeah. is what happened. This is what to do if you get a head injury. Have have some time off. Have a HIA. They don't say if you get repeat head injuries, you might get dementia. And there's there's nowhere that says that. I don't think mm. in any governing body. Uh, I think well, as I've gotten older, definitely. I'm not sure if it's because I've gotten older or because it's more you know, more whatever is more aware of it now and it's more kind of in the media. But certainly now, if I was to get knocked out or concussed or have a head injury, I wouldn't stay on the pitch. No, I'd, I'd have to think of myself first. Um, maybe when I was a bit younger or definitely when I was a bit younger and you kind of a bit, you know, you kind of yeah, grin and bear it. It's the future, you know. It's not that, it's, it's too far away, but now it's not that far away for me.